Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you, members, for being here. We've got uh, four bills on the agenda. Uh, the first one will kick off with uh, House Bill 125 that we uh, carried over from Monday. Before we do that, let me recognize our State Court Judge of the Week, Judge Kent Lawrence. Where is he? Here he is. Judge, thank you for being here. And we have two uh, Superior Court Judges of the Week, Judge Matt Crawford and Judge Bill Hamrick. Where are they? There's Judge Hamrick. And Judge Crawford, I think, is around here somewhere, isn't he? He's around. Judge, good to see you. Mr. Hightower. Chairman, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to present this bill today, members of the committee. Uh, I bring before you all HB 125, uh, just so we're clear on which uh, one we're working from. It's LC 295558S. Um, give you guys um, a little bit of history of how this bill uh, got to me. Uh, this originated when I had a couple of constituents uh, come to me with some licensing issues. Uh, they were needing to renew, renew their license, uh, professional license. One was a plumber, one was an electrician, uh, and they were getting, sorry, a little bit closer. All right. um, they were getting a little close to their, their deadline, and both the, the gentlemen were worried that if they didn't get their renewals, uh, their license renewed in time, that they would not be able to provide for their families. Uh, so I then uh, got in touch with, um, contact the Secretary of State's office and got these guys uh, taken care of uh, and got their license, uh, their license renewed so they can continue working for their families and, and, uh, and doing their work as they do every day. Um, shortly after that, the Secretary of State's office contacted me and uh, said that they understood I, I had a, a, con a grasp of the issue that was before us and before the Secretary of State's office, which is this, uh, they have become inundated with license renewals um, based on uh, some legislation we had passed a couple of years back. Um, this was an unintended consequence that no one really could foresee, and they asked if I would be willing to work with them in making a couple of changes uh, that would fix the problem. Um, and I jumped on board and said that I would. And that's where this bill originally uh, came from and, and stemmed from. Um, there's some, I'll walk through the, the bill with everyone, um, and then at the end, if you may obviously have any questions, Mr. Chairman, I'll be, be glad to take those. Um, as we walk through, do you want me, Mr. Chairman, you can kind of tell me what you want me to do. I can just go through what changes we've made or just walk through it. I think since every member of the, uh, the full committee didn't have the benefit of the subcommittee experience, um, let me ask you just to walk through it from 30,000 feet from a subject matter standpoint. Okay. After that, I'll probably um, ask the subcommittee chair if he has anything to add or subtract, or, and then uh, we'll, we'll do a round uh, okay. after that. Um, if you look in, in Section 1, uh, what we've done there is, is change the definition of physical performance of services. Uh, we've opened that definition up a little bit. The way that it was being interpreted by others was this, the physical performance of services was really only being applied to, uh, I believe it was, uh, the roads and buildings. And this new definition will encompass uh, us to, to get a much larger scope of, of physical performance of services, which is what it was meant to do originally. Um, looking down, some, uh, I had a question of what was changed on this sub from when we were in subcommittee. One thing that we did change is we changed the dollar amount. Um, when you go under physical performance of services, it says using a bidding process or by contract wherein a labor of services exceeds $2,499. When it came out of subcommittee, that was $500. Um, uh, uh, we kind of talked about that and decided that $500 was a little low, uh, and so we decided to bump that up to $2,499. Uh, we've also uh, changed the, the definition of public employer, uh, included, and then below that, subcontractor, uh, adjusted that to include subcontractor or sub-subcontractor. Um, let's see, if we walk through um, the next substantive change uh, that we really were doing, if you go to Section 3, uh, 7A, um, we, we've struck a large portion of that paragraph and, and added in uh, public employers subject to a requirement the subsection shall provide an annual report. What we've done is we, we struck the, the old reporting process. The, the reporting process before uh, when these businesses were having to do these annual reports um, dealt with uh, them having to make three different reports to three different agencies. And what we're doing now is we're consolidating that to one annual report 
uh, to the Department of Audits and Accounts. So we're, we're actually uh, streamlining this a lot, making it easier for, for all these organizations when they do these reports. Um, and we haven't had anybody really uh, push back on that at all. This, this is obviously some, some fixes that we think are very common sense and, and good for everyone and just good policy across the board. If you look at uh, Section 4, uh, there on line 93, uh, we mark out or renews. Uh, what we're doing there, uh, this is on, on your local level when you're dealing with municipalities that do uh, business license, when they issue a business license. Uh, whenever they're issuing these business licenses, when we had the way it read before is that every time someone came in and applied for their business license um, and they um, went through the process of uh, proving whether an employer is exempt from using federal work authorization program as required by this code um, and, and, and went through those proper requirements, we were making it so that they had to do it when they first applied and upon all their renewals. So what we did is we struck the words, the two, two phrases, or renews, and just left that they have to prove that upon uh, their initial application for a business license. And then if you look on lines 110 through 119, uh, that's where we address renewals. And what that substantially says is that upon satisfying the repa requirements of paragraph one of this subsection, for all subsequent renewals of a business license, uh, we're only uh, requiring them to do an affidavit and submit their, their federal work authorization number. So they're not having to submit all these documents every single time they go to renew their business license. They're just going to have to do it on their initial application, and then it's a much easier, much faster process whenever they go through, um, go through the renewal process. If you look at lines uh, 120 uh, through 128, again, this is striking the, the other types of reports that they used to do. Uh, and then 28 through 31 is going back and mirroring the language uh, that we previously just went over on the prior page. Again, it's going to making the reports an annual report uh, and a report that they only have to do to uh, the Department of Audits and, and Accounts instead of having to do three different reports throughout the year to three different agencies. Um, if we jump over to uh, Section 6, uh, which is where we have the, the next largest uh, substantial change, um, it goes to uh, the definition of public benefits. Um, this is one, this section here, if, uh, if you look at lines 195 through 200, what was done is each year before August 1st, the Attorney General had to prepare a report indicating any public benefits uh, that would be administered in the state. And the uh, AG's office would then have to go and look at federal law and come up with a list each and every year of what would count as a as a, um, um, a public benefit. Well, what we've done, the AG's office really wasn't wanting to have to do that every time, and so what we've done is we've struck that. So we're, we're giving less work to the AG's office. Again, again cutting back on, on, on what different agencies have to do, making things a little more streamlined, and we've come up with a definite list of what will qualify um, as a public benefit. Um, and so that, there's the, the new list, and this will be the list, and the, and the list would not change unless we, as the legislator, came back and amended that list. Um, below that, in line 201 through 204, is, is, is simply a, a definition of the SAVE program. Um, it, that This is in the definitions portion of, of Section 6, and we're simply defining uh, the SAVE program. Um, if you go to the next page, which is page 7, uh, lines 207, uh, 210, 212, 213, um, you'll notice that it says uh, under federal immigration law, this was just a technical uh, thing that Ledge Council helped us out with. In the prior bill, when it came out, it said in, uh, pre lawful presence in the United States, Ledge Council, uh, through her due diligence, saw that any time that it was in the code that it said lawful presence in the United States, elsewhere that, that was always accompanied under federal, accompanied with the phrase under federal immigration law. Is that Correct, Bill. Um, and to make everything work and, and be concise and, and be uniform, uh, we added that so that it would match all the other sections of the code. Um, if you go down to line 236 to, uh, to 238, uh, this says all policies of agencies or political subdivisions regarding public benefits for post-secondary education shall comply with federal law um, as provided in 8 U.S.C. section 1623. And if for those of you that don't know that that section, it's very short. I'm going to read it to you real quick because it's easier if I just say what that 
code section is so you know exactly how it applies. And this is how it reads, and, and I'm reading to you 8 U.S.C. section 1623. It says, notwithstanding any other provision of law, an alien who is not lawfully present in the United States shall not be eligible on the basis of residence within a state or a political subdivision for any post-secondary education benefit unless a citizen or natural of the United States is eligible for such a benefit. So really all we're saying is that if an alien is getting a benefit from post-secondary education, we also ha that benefit also has to be extended to um, our sit our natural sit or not natural citizens but citizens or naturals of the United States. So that's not that should be very simple. But I was reading it because it does reference a code section that a lot of people won't have right in front of them. So I was just going to read it to you. But that's all that that does. It says if we're offering it to to aliens, also have to uh, offer it to uh, citizens. If we jump across to lines 241 uh, through 246. What we're doing here, guys, this is um, this is where we're actually getting to uh, the application processes for your, your professional licenses, uh, licenses that go through the, the Secretary of State's office. Um, the big thing here is we want to adjust how people could submit these verifiable documents when uh, when going uh, through this application process. One of the things that we added here, it says any document required by this subparagraph may be submitted on by or on behalf of the applicant. Um, and, and the big thing there was on behalf of the applicant. And here's why. So a lot of times you'll have these vendors that go out and, and do seminars, like if you have a, a guy who's going to teach a lot of plumbers or something, and he, if the, the vendor's there and he can pick up all the, the documents from the plumbers that are at that event, then that gentleman, that vendor, could come back and submit all those applications on behalf of those, of those plumbers. Now, the... the the protection there is that the documents will still have to satisfy the document requirement by being verifiable documents. So it just it was another way to kind of help speed up the process, especially when you have these different type vendors that are out there teaching uh, different programs. Um, let's see. The next line is is going to be 248 uh, through 251. This really goes to how we're going to process those that are under the age of 18. Um, if there's any questions there, I'll be happy to answer those. The skipping down to 261 uh, through 267. Uh, whenever we had uh, did this, when it came to submitting these type of documents, we had left out by mail, uh, and then so we put that back in there. We want, we, again, we're trying to make this as an easy process for people to get their licenses, uh, their, their professional license, and stay stay at work. Uh, so we added that a person could submit these documents by mail or electronically. Uh, then we added a, a little bit of language that says, for purposes of this paragraph, electronic submissions shall include a submission via facsimile, internet, electronic texting, or any other electronically assisted transmitted method approved by the Agency of Political Subdivision. Um, if you look at lines 269 through 274, this is the section that was really clogging up the, uh, the Secretary of State's office. Uh, what was happening, again, it's, it's very similar to what we're doing for the municipalities on the local level. Whenever these people were coming for their professional licenses, they were having to present every, verify all these documents to prove their, their, um, uh, that they were here lawfully, that they were citizens of the United States. And they were having to do it not only on their initial application, but also on their renewal. And the, the, the thought pattern that we're going through here is if you've already proven it once, why make you have to go through that process again and again? I mean, this is just this is just good government, guys. We're 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 here, we're here to to make this more efficient and keep our our constituents um, employed and at their job. And so that's what number four does. It says that requi the requirements of the subsection shall not apply to any applicant applying for or renewing an application for a public benefit within the same state agency or political subdivision, if the applicant has previously complied with the requirements of this subsection by submission of a sworn affidavit and a secure and verifiable document as defined in Code Section 50362, establishing that such applicant is a United States citizen. Now the very last portion of that is very important, establishing that the person is a United States citizen. This one and done, so to speak, application and renewal process is really only going, through, going towards U.S. citizens. If you're not a U.S. citizen, you would have to submit all your verifiable documents to prove that you're in our country lawfully each and every time, okay? 
because your status in our country could change. So it's, if you want upon a new upon renewals for non-citizens, you would have to continue doing those documents every time, and and that's appropriate uh, because their status could change here. Um, let's see. If we go towards uh, lines. Uh, 293 through 297, again, this is going back to the reporting uh, requirements. We're changing that where you only have to make one annual report and you only have to make that report to one agency, which is, which is the Department of Community Affairs. Um, again, and just for, for, for everyone to see, under um, lines 280, 281, and 302, again, we added from when we came out of the subcommittee to now, we added under federal immigration law just because that is a technical change that needed to be made to make this uniform with the rest of uh, the code sections. The next uh, big change is going to be under Section 7. Um, if everyone will go to lines 355 through 363, uh, what you have there, um, l let me give you a little bit of background. Um, we have had, since um, the immigration reform came through, um, which which I was very much in support of when it happened. But anytime you do any type of large reform, you're gonna. You, there's no way you can know how everything's gonna be implemented once in practice. Um, and this is one of the things that we found that was that was being abused. Uh, what's going on is whenever um, you have a lot of folks, and I'll give an example, that um, someone that's that's not a citizen of here, um, that's um, would go to the uh, Mexican consulate, so uh, in this example, and they would get a passport. And then they were turning around and trying to use that passport to prove that they were lawfully here within the United States. But that passport wasn't, I mean, it, was, it wasn't a passport to prove anything. I mean, it wasn't something that, our, that the United States had, had approved through or put a seal on or put a stamp on. It was just a passport that they were start, these consulates were starting to pump out to these guys, and they were using it kind of as a loophole, as one of their verifiable documents when going through the process to prove their lawful presence here in the United States. So all this says, we're, we're not saying that you can't use those passports. We are saying that uh, in this term, it says, the term secure and verifiable documents shall not include any foreign passport unless the passport is submitted with a valid United States Homeland Security form, and then it goes through the different form numbers there, um, or proof of lawful presence in the United States under federal immigration law, um, a birth certificate issued by a foreign country unless accompanied by a passport submitted with appropriate immigration documents, including visa and other United States Homeland Security forms. And then again, it gives those forms. So this was just a measure to plug a very much needed loophole uh, that people had found and were, were then abusing uh, the system. Um, if we go down to uh, 374 through 378, uh, this is this again goes towards language on how to submit these documents. Uh, we added uh, again the the by mail uh, electronically, and uh, again as before, this was just to expedite the process um, and how people can submit these uh, submit these documents and coming up to speed with our current technology and the fact they could do it electronically. Um, going out to section eight, uh, section eight goes through all the reporting requirements. Uh, the reporting requirements, again, when I mentioned several times about three different sections in the bill go towards reporting. And now we're making it where it's one report, one time a year, to one agency. Uh, and this goes through what's going to be required in that report um, and, and what we're going to be looking for in that, por in that report and who they actually have to make the report to. So. Let me ask uh, Chairman Ramsey if he has anything to add as chairman of the subcommittee. Um, not much, Mr. Chairman. I just first want to tip, tip my cap to the uh, author of the bill, Representative Hightower. He's done yeoman's work on this. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with him on it. Um, what this does is just provides for a, a number of enhancements to our state's current policy um, with respect to addressing the social and economic consequences of illegal immigration. It streamlines some uh, administrative difficulties and bureaucracies we didn't intend when we have written the various bills over the years. It also plugs some loopholes that have um, evolved that we couldn't anticipate. So did an excellent job explaining the bill. Um, I will, Legislative Council, when the time is appropriate, there is a minor technical amendment I'm going to need to make on line 368. There's a cross-reference that's incorrect, so when the time's right, I'll make that amendment, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, but but really just want to say I fully support the bill, really appreciate the author's work on it, and uh, look forward to moving it on to the floor. Thank you. Questions from the, um, from the committee for the author? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Hightower. Let me call on um, Deborah Nesbitt with the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia or Michael McPherson. I'm not sure. Deborah, okay. Jim, you want me to stay here? Yep, sure. That sounds good. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> members of the committee. Michael McPherson with the Georgia Municipal Association. Uh, and this is Deborah Nesbitt. Deborah Nesbitt, ACCG. Uh, we feel that, that the bill streamlines reporting and uh, reduces affidavits for our citizens, so we, we support this bill. We appreciate all the work the author did um, to eliminate those burdens on local governments. Thank you for working with the author and the subcommittee chair on, on a system that works. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from members of the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Mr. John Barber with the uh, Georgia Association of Realtors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John Barber of the Realtors. Uh, on behalf of the 26,000 realtors across the state, I okay. appreciate uh, the author's work on this. I think it's a very good public policy. I like the uh, strong reason that Mr. Pearson just mentioned. Uh, realtors don't have uh, timely access to license, licensure renewal. Uh, they don't sell, they don't. Uh, so we're in full support. I really appreciate uh, the work. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Mr. D.A. King, representing himself. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, my name is D.A. King. Let I me ask you to pull the microphone just a little bit closer. Thank my you. name is D.A. King, and I am here as the citizen that I am. In the past, when I came to the Capitol regularly, I dealt a lot with illegal immigration legislation. I would like to add to Representative Ramsey's um, appraisal of, of the sponsor's description of his bill. It was superbly done. It's a great bill, and I am here in, in heavy support of that bill. Um, I did come with some information in case there was any questions on the secure and verifiable identity documents concerning the foreign passports. If there's no questions, I'll just uh, settle for the handout to, to go out. Uh, and I hope it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman, I have a question. I, is it okay if I ask a question about the code that is in front of us? That depends. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of like to move things along. I've got three other sponsors that are stacked up. I, um, we, if there's we, an issue with the bill or if you want to I, I believe it say would be amen. a, a five-minute time saver in the future, but it's certainly the, 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 the Chairman's pleasure. I mean, if there's an issue, we'd like to hear it, but if not, um, if you have an endorsement. It, I, mean, it's, I, I believe it to be a potential issue, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, we'd okay. It would involve uh, the text on line 68 and 69. And again, I'm, I'm doing this in, in, in anticipation of saving some time, and I may be overlooking something, but in the history of this code section, and I was here when it was created in 2006, um, it's been altered several times. Currently, a, a contractor contracting with any public employer is bound to sign on affidavit swearing he's using the E-Verify system. Further, he is bound to ensure that any subcontractors of any level are doing the same. I cannot figure out in this language when it says on six, line 69 that subcontractors who present an affidavit to the contractor with the same information, and then further down, on line 74, it says, affidavit shall be maintained by the public employer for five years from the date of receipt. And again, very respectfully, if I'm missing something, I can't see where there is any codified process by which the contractor or the subcontractor turns over to the public employer the copies of that affidavit, and neither can I understand how it could become a public record if it's only in the hands of a contractor. Does the author or Mr. Ramsey want to address that? And if not, maybe it's something we'll just take under advisement in the context of a modified structured rule if necessary. 
I, I think I, w I would have to read the rest of the, yeah. the code all around it, to, and I don't think it's something we can answer on the fly here. Um, I, I think it's probably something as it moves through the process. We've still got plenty of opportunities along the way to address the issue. I would suggest we move forward and put a little time into researching the issue and deal with it. I agree. I appreciate the time very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. King. I see when no one else um, signed up to speak on House Bill 125. With that, we'll take it back into the committee. Uh, what is the pleasure of the committee? Mr. Ramsey. Mr. Chairman, I move uh, do pass uh, to the committee substitute to House Bill 125, which is LC 295558S. Well, let me also say to members, I think you also had in your file um, a letter from the Georgia Chamber of Commerce and the letter from the National Federation of Independent Business on, on the bill, just, just to make sure you have those as well. Second by Ms. Ballinger of uh, Mr. Ramsey's motion of do pass House Bill 125 by substitute LC 295558S. Are there any amendments, Mr. Ramsey? Uh, on line 368, uh, the, uh, I would replace uh, the F, the subsection F. It needs to be subsection G to be a proper cross-reference. Striking um, on line 368. F and inserting G in its place. Any objection to the amendment? Hearing none, it's adopted. Any further amendments? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion will signify by saying aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Hightower. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll call, call Mr. Sorry. Chairman, can I add yep. one thing? Sure. Um, I would love to take full credit for this, but uh, Mr. Ramsey has worked with me step for step with this and uh, deserves a lot of the credit. He has, he has helped me and guided me through this process, and, uh, and I greatly appreciate his, his uh, tutelage and friendship on this. He's a workhorse, no yes. doubt about it. Let me call um, House Bill 271, Chairman Neal. Mr. Peake and Mr. Caldwell, uh, we, uh, I anticipate calling Representative Peake's bill after, and then Mr. Caldwell, if you, I don't want you to have to s sit around. We can take your we can take your cell number and text you when we're on the five minute warning. Nowhere else to go. Okay. <laughs> I understand. Sometimes it's just good to sit and rest, right? I hear you. I'm, I'm appreciating that more and more every day. Chairman Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I have House Bill 271, and I am uh, proud to say that House Bill 271 has been finally worked by uh, the subcommittee, and uh, we're looking at record restriction, and we have, uh, we have, as far as I know, everybody uh, has reached consensus on this one, and uh, uh, we, should be, uh, we should be in good shape with it. Uh, there's um, uh, a couple of things primarily that House Bill 271 does, and this is uh, uh, piggybacking on criminal justice reform last year and what we do with record restriction, uh, beginning with line 12. Uh, it, it clarifies uh, uh, a little more specifically uh, what is uh, eligible for record restriction uh, in a case where uh, uh, an offender was charged with a, a felony and uh, um, convicted of a lesser offense uh, arising out of that underlying transaction or occurrence is the way uh, we passed it last year. We just wanted to, to make sure that um, uh, it was a little bit more specific. And if, um, uh, if the lesser offense is, if the, the misdemeanor that they're convicted of is not a lesser offense of that felony charge, uh, they will be uh, eligible for restriction according to uh, to the language that, that we have before us. Um, also, on page one, um, lines 22 uh, or 23 rather, uh, is uh, is the uh, dealing with that same uh, instant where the misdemeanor conviction was not a lesser offense of the felony charge. Uh, so th that's the clarification in those two. Um, passages of, of House Bill 271. Uh, on the second page uh, deals with uh, uh, the uh, responsibilities with the prosecuting attorney denying the request. Um, 
when someone uh, requests record restriction, within 90 days of receiving the request, the request prosecuting attorney shall review the request to determine if the request meets the criteria set forth in subsection H of this code section. So uh, we want to make sure that the the uh, prosecuting attorney is, is using the criteria outlined uh, in statute to determine whether that uh, uh, particular offense meets the uh, the eligibility for record restriction. If the prosecuting attorney, verse 39, then, or verse <laughs> line 29, that's the preacher coming out of me in front of the attorneys here. Okay. We so could we'll use look, a little of that. We'll look at verse, we'll look at verse 39. We could use some. We'll get to we'll get to Corpus Christi in a little bit if we're here too long, Mr. Chairman. If the prosecuting attorney denies such request, he or she shall cite with specific specificity the reason for the denial in writing. Uh, we want to make sure that if an offender uh, is denied, they know why they were denied, and uh, 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 with that uh, knowledge to why they were denied, uh, they will have the opportunity at that point to know whether to appeal that. Uh, or not, there will be a presumption, uh, line 42, a presumption that the prosecuting attorney does not object to the request to restrict uh, if they fail to respond for the determination within a 90-day period set forth in the paragraph. Um, a as we go on to line 54, the decision of the prosecuting attorney to decline a request to restrict access to criminal history uh, will uh, shall be upheld unless the individual, the offender, demonstrates by clear and convincing evidence that the arrest is eligible for record restriction pursuant to subsection H of the code section. Um, these are the changes that we are proposing, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, Mr. Chairman, we have consensus on them, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the author? Seeing none, Mr. Spejas, <laughs> do the, either the state or the Superior Court judges have any comment on this from a process standpoint? Judge Lawrence? No. Mr. Pack. At the proper time, Mr. Chairman, I would like, well, I would like to make a motion. Ms. Dotson, are you here? Mm -hmm. Do you want to speak or do you want me to recognize Mr. Pack for a motion? That's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hereby, hereby move to pass HB 271, LC 295536, substitute. Mr. Pack moves to pass HB 271, LC 295536S, second by Ms. Ballinger. Are there any amendments? Seeing none, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Appreciate it. And uh, to the subcommittee, Mr. Spahos and Ms. Dodson, everybody that worked so hard on this. Uh, great work, and thank you all so much. Good work going on today. Mr. Peake. Mr. Chairman, member of the commission. If it's okay, I've got a couple of folks with me. Sure, have please. Come join me. Um, Absolutely. Um, Ray Higgins, who's Deputy Commissioner, DCAL, and our um, legal counsel. Good to be with you here today. I appreciate the opportunity to visit with the committee on HB 350. We do have a uh, substitute. Um, I want to make sure we've got the correct one for the committee. I think Randy's been on the spot and got the right one, I think. So um, LC 295557S, I believe is the right one. So if it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, I'll kind of give a summary of the bill and, and then we'll uh, answer some questions and fire away. Um, the Georgia Department of Early Care and Learning, which is commonly referred to as DCAV, which Ray Higgins is Deputy Commissioner, administers the uh, Georgia's pre-K license, regulates child care providers. Uh, over 6,300 uh, child care programs, approximately 350,000 children in our state. Uh, the purpose of this legislation is to improve child safety by uh, enhancing the criminal record check uh, in a child care program. Uh, currently, the director of a center uh, is required to have a fingerprint or biometric check. Uh, the, regular, the regular employees are only required to have a name-based search of Georgia records only. This bill, this bill will begin to require national fingerprint biometric uh, fingerprint-based check, background check for all employees. 
the highlights of the legislation are this. It requires a national fingerprint-based uh, records check for all new employees uh, starting in January of 2014. This will be employees from bus drivers to um, kitchen personnel to any person that works at the daycare uh, facility. Uh, two, it will require a national fingerprint-based check for all decal employees. Uh, that, that they said if it's going to be good for employees who are working in the licensed child care agencies, they're going to do it themselves. So this will be for all employees as well, too. Uh, current child care center employees will have until 2017 to have the new check. So if you have a daycare center, um, uh, you have employees there, uh, in order to ease the burden of the additional cost, of which there will be some, we've given the daycare, uh, licensed daycare centers uh, until January 1 of 2017 to receive the new check. Now, there is a high turnover in this industry, so there is a good chance that by 2017 um, all employees would already have background check uh, by this time as well, too. So. Uh, then once implemented, all employees will be subject to a five-year recheck, uh, similar to what is required for public school employees and teachers as well, too. There is a provision included that allows uh, the centers to hire an employee immediately, as they do now, after a satisfactory Georgia record search. And uh, this will allow child care providers to hire staff quickly when they need to ensure proper child ratios and uh, safety and oversight as well, too. Uh, DCAL uh, has worked really close with the Georgia Child Care Association. I think they have some folks here that probably would like to testify as well, too. They have been great to work with. We've been very concerned about making sure that uh, small business employers like, uh, like our child care daycare centers um, are, are in support of this bill and on board with it. Uh, we've also been working with the GBI to make sure this makes sense and it works. And, um, and then the final piece, um, I've asked, been asked about the cost of it. Right now it costs, up, and Ray can kind of confirm this, it's about $35 for the Georgia um, background check, uh, which just checks to see if you have a crime in Georgia. To do the na biometric national fingerprint check uh, is $50. But when you do that, it includes the Georgia as well, too. So it's, just, it's an additional cost of about $15 per employee uh, to do this additional check. Uh, $15 well worth it to make sure that we – didn't miss it on some employee who maybe would be have a record of a sexual or felony uh, background uh, record um, in another state. Make sure our children are safe. So, Mr. Chairman, that's basically the nuts and bolts of the bill. Um, I'll defer to questions, or if you like the testimony from Deputy Commissioner. Mr. Higgins, do you want to make a uh, you want to make a statement, and then we can open up for questions. I would just say that I think Representative Pete covered it very well. We appreciate you hearing it today and just think this would be a great step forward for, for child safety. That cost of the additional cost on the on the check is? Is about $15 right. per employee. It's silent on who bears that cost. Okay. Um, we leave that up to the market to decide. I would believe that probably most businesses, uh, in order to attract good employees, would probably end up bearing that cost themselves mm -hmm. rather than passing on to the employees. Well, they'll pass it on to customers, but it's well worth the expense, that's for sure. Questions for the author? Going once. Seeing none. Mr. Sessler. We, we really tried to grill Representative Peek in the subcommittee, but good. we couldn't find much to grill him over. Good. They, they, <laughs> you did so, pretty good. Uh, I, I'm homework. not a lawyer, and I don't pretend to be one. I didn't stay at Holiday Inn last night either, so I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pack says he wasn't there, so that was probably yeah, the, the yeah, reason for it. He is a member of both subcommittees. They were pretty gentle. So he can play that role, but, you know. I promised them dinner at Cheddar's if they <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, And they took it very quickly. <laughs> well, you know, there you go. <laughs> All right. We've got a, a couple people signed up to speak. Uh, Ms. Polly McKinney, Voices for George, uh, George's Children. Hi, I'm um, Polly McKinney. I'm with Voices for Georgia's Children, as you just heard. Um, and we support HB uh, 350, and I'll make it brief because I know it's a long day for everybody. Thank you. Um, we, we think it's really important to get past the state background checks to federal checks because you don't even have to be present to have a state background check done because it's a name and social security number. You can just fax it in. Um, the other thing is 26 other states do background checks for their birth to five populations. We think that's really important. Georgia does – national background check for K-12, and we think that the little guys should have just as much security as the big guys. Um, and the other thing that I, I said the other day, and I just can't say often enough, is kids who are ages zero to five are not always able to articulate, if ever, when they have been abused and neglected. And I think that we, it's our job to do everything we can to protect those kids. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thanks for your work. Thanks. 
Ellen Reynolds, Georgia Child Care Association. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we really want to thank the author of this bill and the department. Many, many, many hours went into this compromise and this legislation, um, and we believe it's a really important step. One thing I want you all to be aware of is in case you do get pushback from any individual provider, because obviously there's 3,000 providers out there, what you should know is that all of our five border states already require this fingerprint background check. By not doing it, it's creating a donut hole that's almost attracting felons who know they can't work in those states because of fingerprint background check. So we feel like it's a really important step forward. Um, you know, the one, the one piece that we do have to mention that it's not anything we want to hold up this bill is that right now summer programs and uh, after school programs are all exempt from all licensing. You could have one child of uh, 16 years old overseeing 500 kids, and we hope that in the future the legislature will look to extending this same protection to kids who are in summer camps and after school programs. Any questions for Ms. Reynolds? Seeing none, thank you. Pamela Perkins Karn, is that right, with the Interfaith Children's Movement? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this opportunity to speak before the committee. Uh, the Interfaith Children's Movement is a child advocacy organization that uh, is mobilized to support children in Georgia, and we do support HB 350, understanding the need for protection and safety of our children. On a personal basis, I, I had to be fingerprinted to have a low-level bank job. So I do understand that if I had to have had no access to any cash, but if that required fingerprinting, then certainly our children required uh, to have safe adults around them. So thank you for your support of this bill. Thank you for your comments. All right, I see no one else signed up to speak on House Bill 350. Mr. Ramsey. Is, is it appropriate for a motion now, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I, I, I just also want to say to the author how much I appreciate this bill. My youngest is now in kindergarten, so they're out of, out of um, daycare, but uh, um, really glad that you all guys, yeah, I think this is long overdue, really glad that you've taken this issue on, and I think it's going to really serve our, our, our ch the children of this state well. I uh, just want to proudly offer a, a, a due pass recommendation to House Bill 350 LC 29-5557S. Mr. Ramsey moves due pass of House Bill 350 by substitute LC 29-5557S. Is there a second? Second by Mrs. Cooper. Are there any amendments? Seeing none, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Peek. Appreciate your support. Thank you. House Bill 407. Somehow, Representative Caldwell, I see Representative Powell on, but somehow Representative Caldwell is here. Did someone lose a bet or? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> oh, let me just get my head around that first. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, as you said, I am not the author of this bill, and I might have lost the bet is the reason that I'm here. Thank you for being here, though. maybe because uh, by the time we get through with this, he would have wished that that he is someplace else, and I probably would have wished I'm someplace else. But be that as it may, uh, he asked if I would present this bill. And with me here today is Mr. Harris Blackwood, who is the director of the governor's office of highway safety. And uh, they're certainly in support of this bill. This is not the governor's bill, uh, but he is aware of it and supports it. And also here in capacity to help answer questions, if there are any, is senior uh, judge uh, back here with <coughs> Kent Lawrence, who is also now working as an advisor with the Governor's Office of Highway Safety. And I might also say that uh, Mr. Les Hammonds of Driver Services is always is also here, and they are also in support of this bill. What I would like to do is just give an overview of what this bill is about, and then if questions, of course, these gentlemen would be more expertise to answer it than I can. But basically, everybody knows that Georgia receives federal highway funds to the tune of about a billion dollars a year. And by receiving those funds, then we are required to uh, abide by, or at least try to abide by, certain rules and regulations they have concerning rules of the road. And in this respect, having to do with 
uh, drivers who have been convicted of at least the second or third or subsequent DUIs. Georgia law is not in compliance presently with the amended act of the Highway Safety Bill. And what that bill basically provides is that uh, individuals who have the second or subsequent DUIs on their record are required to have interlock uh, ignition put on their vehicles and certain other provisions. Georgia law as it presently is, why it provides for that, it also provides that we're able to lessen time restraints for somebody to get a, their license back. Uh, and it also we lessen, we have some fees that are not in compliance with the federal act. And what it all boils down to is that all this bill does is amends our Rules of the Road Act of basically Title 40 and Title 42 to put us in compliance with the federal act. If we don't come in compliance, uh, we are subject to losing about $25 million or at least having it set aside into another reserve where the feds will tell us what we can do with it instead of use it for our own, our own purposes. So that's the general basis of this bill. It does not lessen uh, our rules of the road. It does not lessen the convictions for DUI, but it just puts us in compliance, basically with time constraints of when you can get a hard license back as well as in what period of time you can be on probation. And I think I, of course, is that correct? You are absolutely correct. And uh, these gentlemen, as I say, know 10 times more about this than I, and that's the reason they are here. But uh, any questions that I might can answer, I'll be glad to, and certainly I know these gentlemen can. As a Superior Court judge, I dealt with DUIs because in two of my four counties, I had misdemeanors as well as just felonies. But certainly not to the extent that, that Judge Lawrence has, and I would certainly uh, succeed to him any questions concerning this because he's more of the expert than I am. Ms. Blackwood, you want to weigh yes, in? Yes, sir. We, we have a kind of a two situations happen. Last July, the Congress passed a new Transportation Act, New Surface Transportation Act called MAP 21. And we are just in the in the throes of getting the information on that. It was it was passed very quickly, and we are in the process right now of a comment period on some of the regulations. Also, the DUI uh, revisions that were passed by the General Assembly last year went into effect on July on January 1st of this year. So we did not get a, a any a re, um, review of those until earlier this month. And as soon as we got that review and found out we were not in compliance, we began working on this, working uh, through the process, and uh, we come to you. Uh, in support of this, and uh, we believe that first of all, it does not it does not weaken our our statute. It it, it actually extends that time. It is uh, what what the federal government wants is either 12 months hard suspension or 12 months on an ignition interlock, and uh, that, I think that provides uh, sufficient time. And it also provides protection. We do have incentives in in this that for persons who are going into treatment courts, they would have a 45 day hard suspension followed by 12 months on the on an interlock and uh, we believe that it, it, it is uh, uh, while it came a little unexpectedly we believe it would be beneficial to the people of the state. Let me just make sure I understand that with regard to after the six month suspension the completion of risk reduction program or after 45 days of suspension as a condition of probation through enrollment in a drug court program these are all specifically prescribed in, in the federal MAP-21 law? The, the, the part that is prescribed in, in the MAP-21 is the 12 months on, uh, on, on the interlock or 12 months hard suspension if they do nothing. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Hightower. If, if we look at line 67, the, the way that it was before and we some of this we're changing from what we just changed last year correct or, yes sir because last year we had changed it on a second time DUI just a little history and you probably know all this before last year second time DUI within five years hard suspension for one year and I mean no way around that and then you had to have an interlock knit device in your car for six months so really your suspension was 18 months six months of that would be with an interlock device Last year we came in and said if you go through a drug court program, they would lessen that one year suspension to four months or 120 days. If you enrolled in a program and met these other requirements, then after four months you get a limited permit, correct? Yes, correct. And so what 
this is now mm -hmm. doing is saying, and I just want to make clear that I, that I understand it, is that we're saying that that four months, we're making it six months, but we're also saying that if they do it with an interlock device in their car, they only have to wait 45 days on the suspension. If they're in the treatment court. If they're in treatment court. Yes, well, the 120, they had to be in a treatment court for that to qualify as well. Yeah, and, and what that added up to was one year. Right. Uh, so what we've done is, is we've made that 45 days hard suspension followed by one year on the interlock. Okay, my, the, the, the question directly on 67, I want to make sure I have my mind wrapped around the concepts, but going back to 67, the reason we do 120 days and just, instead of just putting four months there is because different months have different days. Right. Why are we going with six months instead of 180 days? Because I, I would think we'd want 180 days, would we not? I, I, just for me, for, for, for clarity, 180 days would be much clearer for me because I don't have to figure out, I mean, as an attorney, when I have clients, that I'm not going to email you as much or call you every other month like I do now. <laughs> Thank you. I'll tell her you said that, by the way. Um, it, it would be easier for me when I'm dealing with a client instead of having to count six months when I start in the middle of the month. You know what I mean? It's, it, it'd be much easier if I can just say, all right, from today, when you're sentenced, it's 180 days. And I, I, would, I would think we would need to change that to a day. It's 180 days and six months. We have no objection. Okay. Do you have, any, do you have anything else? Just to be clear, and uh, this bill, I understand this was one of those occasional legislative fire drills that has to do with federal compliance, and we understand that. But being late is also a, a dangerous time. I just want to make sure that everything we have in here is a, is a federal mandate. Are we making? Are there any discretionary changes that are being made here, as opposed to strict compliance with a federal mandate? Okay. Thanks for being here. Yes, sir. The only aspect of the bill that is federally mandated is the one-year block for the ignition interlock. The rest was crafted with um, input from the members of the judiciary, particularly members of the state court judges' council. Um, the the starting at the at the beginning of the bill, um, the changes on lines 23 through 25 are not federally mandated. That was intended as cleanup. Um, that language was added on the floor of the House about five years ago. Um, we've never been able to uh, impose the recidivist fee because the fee was never defined. So that's in there as cleanup. Um, on line 33, that is federally mandated language going from six months to a year on the, the MAP 21 requirement for interlock. Um, the change on line 57, was precipitated by a request from the, the judges, particularly the state court judges. Um, they would like to be able to offer limited driving permits as an incentive to their accountability court participants, even if those folks have a second um, administrative license suspension based upon their blood alcohol concentration at the time of the arrest, or if they have an administrative suspension based on a refusal. They were under the impression they had accomplished that last year in Senate Bill 236. It was not. So was I. Um, no. Judge Golick and I have actually had that conversation as well. Um, she's, so got, she's got a list. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was something that was not accomplished okay. in last year's bill. So okay. we're, we're trying to accomplish it in this bill. As you go down into um, line 62 through 73, um, it, it's just shifting the timeline in making the decision to uh, on what period of hard suspension was deemed appropriate. We, we definitely deferred to the state court judges, particularly those with accountability courts in their jurisdiction because of um, their experience in dealing with drivers and drivers becoming engaged in sobriety and engaged in the treatment process. Um, and we're really frankly creating an incentive to, for folks to participate in accountability courts by creating the, the differentiation between those who are in one versus those who aren't. Okay. Uh, so that's right there. Sure, Mr. Hightower. <laughs> Actually, you know what, let me let Ms. Anders go ahead and go forward, and then I want to call on some other folks for a round, but I will come back. I think, members, what we're going to do is, uh, depending on how this conversation goes right now, I mean, what I'm hearing is that there is federal mandate in here. 
but there's also material, uh, a fair amount that is not a mandate. And so, yes, and that's the, not a crime last time I checked, but I, I think from a procedural standpoint, what we may do, members of the committee, is given that we're coming up on day 30 next week and our next regularly scheduled meeting is Monday, what we may do, I mean, may, is use this meeting as sort of a macro subcommittee um, so that for purposes of uh, full committee consideration. So we may defer action on this today in order to let some of the discretionary pieces of this sink in, allow for some questions and some absorption, and um, especially in light of the fact that we have potentially a second effort and a second bill going in later on in the session as a placeholder for next session having to do with Chairman Rice's Title 40 study committee from last year. So we want to make sure that the left hand is talking to the right hand. So just remember, you can be aware of how we, we may just approach that. but. Please continue, then we'll continue our questions. Um, scrolling down, uh, line 74 through 84, um, that's the specific language about admission and a lot under driving permit and it does create the differentiation. 45 days would be the earliest the court could approve a permit if you're in an accountability court, otherwise it would be the six months. Um, lines, line 89 is the change that allows, the second place that allows for the permit if the defendant has and a second and five year administrative suspension or a suspension based on a refusal. Um, lines 91 through 102 are um, making some changes to the permissible uses of the permits. When NHTSA made the change about the interlock requirement and extending the time period, they made clear that they were taking off the handcuffs, if you'll pardon the pun, with regard to the scope of the permit that's allowed. You may recall from last year in Senate Bill 236, they were very uh, demanding. Tell me again permit. where you are. I'm sorry, lines 97 through 107, I'm, I'm sorry, 109. Um, they were very demanding about what they would <coughs> allow uh, for the scope of the permissible uses of the permit and what they would not allow, so we're expanding that um, because they've taken those, those limitations off. Line 135. Um, is the one year change that is mandated by NHTSA. Um, going down to lines 146 through um, really it's the balance through 233 is talking about the procedural aspects of uh, the courts making the interlock requirement a condition of probation. Um, it's something that the courts are ordering, and there's there's not language in the bill, but there's existing language in the DUI statute that directs the courts to do what is in these code sections. And then uh, section four is the same language as it applies to habitual violators. Habitual violators are individuals who've been convicted of three or more predicate offenses within five years. Um, so it would be those who have two DUIs and another of the most serious offenses or three DUIs within five years applying the same uh, requirement to them once they're eligible for a probationary license. And then we have the effective date. Mr. Sessler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ammons, uh, welcome to the committee. Um, I've had some folks raise to me over the years a concern, you know, when, when we're looking at a 12-month interlock period, uh, you know, what is the what is the hammer that the court has over individuals who, who, who are uh, on an interlock regimen if they're not under probation? I mean, obviously, if you have a, have a, have a misdemeanor offense, um, many times folks aren't being sentenced to a full year. What ability do we have to really enforce a interlock program if there's not, if someone's not in the probation status? For the folks who are not in probation, there's already existing language in Chapter 8 of Title 42 that indicates that the admission interlock provider is to report to the DDS if the customer is not um, reporting in on a monthly basis as they're directed to, to have the machine monitored. They're also to report to the DDS if the, the machine has been tampered with. And then DDS would revoke the permit and there would be consequences associated with that. But what remedy really is there if they're not fulfilling that? I mean, is there a, um, I, I've heard from interlock providers that they they have a hard time. I mean, they, they can report that, 
um, but there's not the, the courts don't have the, the hammer beyond that that period. Um, if, if there's a procedural thing that I don't understand, I don't practice law in this area for sure. To, to be sure, I, I've just heard from providers that it's kind of a um, they always seem like they're behind the eight ball trying to enforce compliance when the court doesn't have that that hook on people. If the person is off probation, that court would not have a, a hammer, if you will. DDS does retain a hammer. If the person continues to drive and is caught by law enforcement, the, there are a multitude of consequences, um, all sorts of, of criminal charges associated with driving without the, the interlock. It would either be driving on suspended license or driving in violation of a limited driving permit and the consequences associated with that. But if the person has an interlock device on their car, um, and, and it, I've gotten a little hazy on some of the reporting requirements and the check-in and some of that stuff, but if they're if if they're if the device is on their car, but they're not being they're not fulfilling their timelines, whether it's a check-in with a certain level of frequency, but it's still on their car, what ability do we really have to force them? In a, in, I mean, I know, I know the federal government said go forth and make a 12-month requirement, but are there any sort of self-executing provisions, or do you not then just have to take their non-compliance as evidence for another case that you're going to have to bring against them, so that you're you're, you're kind of behind every step of the way. If they're not reporting to the provider center like they're supposed right. to, yeah. the provider center reports that to DDS, and DDS revokes the permit. So the, the consequence at that point is that they can't drive anymore, at least not legally. Mm -hmm. um, th but there's not a, a monetary consequence. Uh, there's certainly not any sort of incarceration, incarceration consequence unless they're caught driving within a vehicle that doesn't have the, the device. So, so they do kind of, granted, there's some remedies with respect to, to pulling their license and if they're subsequently caught, but there's really not a, a provision you can go um, bring them in and throw them back in jail and, hey, you, you violated conditions of probation. I think the way that, that a lot of courts would retain jurisdiction, and, and I think Judge Lawrence can speak to this because he and I have had this conversation, what they'll do is they'll make the the moving violation that is the, the underlying probable cause for the traffic stop that brought about the DUI charge, they, they will run that sentence consecutively to the sentence for the DUI charge so that they'll have 24 months of probation or okay. if there are multiple counts, stack them up. Most of the accountability court programs are going to be more than a year in length, and, and that's how that they, they get that that oversight over that person for that period of time is by is by stacking those 12 month sentences consecutively so okay. that they are on probation for an extended period of time. Um, because the suspension for a second and five DUI is 18 months, you would certainly need a, a two counts to, to get you that 24 month window or at least an 18 month window where the court would retain some subject matter jurisdiction over the person. So, so if someone was stopped at a traffic at a license check, for example, and they, they looked like they had Look like they were drunk or they smelled alcohol. You know, really the only thing you've got on them is a DI. There's no other speeding offense or reckless driving or crossing center line. There's really nothing you could use to kind of stack together. Right. Um, and, and I don't know in practice if judges use that hammer to extend that to an 18 to 24 month period. I just I've heard a lot of feedback from the industry that it's a it's a very sketchy thing to do beyond that probation period. <laughs> me that he had done in Clark County was if there was an additional moving violation, they would run them consecutively so that they would have that, that full period of time with that defendant under their control. And I'm certain it varies by jurisdiction. Mr. Ramsey, and then back to Mr. Hightower. Uh, just a couple questions. Um, the, the first change, line 23 to 25, you suggested that this is because I guess because of the lack of a definition of recidivist conviction, you've never been able to impose that additional fee. In the so the legislature at one point made a public policy decision, if you're a recidivist, you're going to pay more to get your license restored. Um, so I guess what I would ask you in, this, in the time period, uh, and I think that's a public policy decision for this committee and this General Assembly, what I would ask you is to help come up with a way um, I'm interested in preserving that additional fee. Um, I, I think if you are a recidivist, you should pay more to get your license back. So I, I would ask you, all of you collectively, the author of the bill, to come up with a way to clarify it so you can impose that fee, that, that fee properly mm -hmm. um, between now and when we act on this bill. Just by way of background, I think it's an interesting question. Is it the last legislative session or the year before that? And 
Well, we were advised either by this committee or another committee that that was not desired, but we can certainly explore that now if the, if the mood has changed. Well, I, I, certainly it's something for the committee to consider, but I... I Your subsequent convictions. Um, the other, the other question, line nine and seven. Um, this is, this comes from the bill from last year that requires that, that provides for a very limited driving permit, and it looks like the change, the and dri the uh, on the end of line ninety seven and driving for work purposes. The effect of that is, is, is you're preserving the right for people that drive for a living, whether it's a pizza delivery person or a. CDL license holder or school bus driver to allow them to do that to get a limited driving permit, and that's another public policy that frankly I'm not comfortable with. Um, so uh, again, it's something um, I don't I don't view that as 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 a as a kind of a housekeeping thing. That's a uh, I see the wisdom in allowing a person to get to a job that doesn't require them to drive for a living, but a person that drives for a living um, um, who's who's, who's being punished for their for, for being uh, for the drive driving under the influence, I think we need to take a long hard look about allowing them to get a driving permit that allows them to drive for a living during the pendency of that punishment. So, uh, again, it's things for the committee to think about um, and just really offer that more of a comment than a question. Let's try, John. Sam is really directed. At this is going to go to your your question. Uh, this. A lot of times your judges the take the, uh, most judges in these situations, they are going to run these terms consecutively to get that time frame that they need. Um, every now and then you may have a situation where you have someone that's stuck at a, stopped at a, a checkpoint that may only have one charge, but typically they're able to get that 24 months. There's, there's almost always an opportunity where they can do that. And most judges are going to find a way to get that. Um, because we, um, right now, even under the old law where it was 18 months on a suspension for a second, I mean, I, I do this all the time in my comp in my practice, I mean, I do DUI law, and it's very rare for you to have a situation where a judge cannot make a turn a sentence consecutive where they can catch that 24 months. It may happen very seldomly, but it is very seldom. And again, to your your, your question and concern about the. Um, not having a, a, a hammer, so to speak. If these people, let's say it is just 12 months, and and they don't, we don't have them on probation anymore, uh, the court doesn't have them on, have them on probation anymore, and DDS gets a report back that says their license is now suspended, that person from that point forward, any time they're behind that wheel, will be breaking the law. I mean, they're going to be running the chance that not only are they going to be, are they breaking the law, but when you're caught driving on a suspended license, they arrest you. It's an arrestable offense. So if they get caught, they, they're taking a chance. They're going to get arrested the, the, the moment they're caught, and they're going to go all the way back through the system and get sentenced to a full another year of probation and possibly another suspension. So the hammer is that they're taking a risk upon themselves to break the law, and they will be in violation of the law for as long going forward as they can because they cannot get another valid license until they fulfill this requirement. So if they are running for the next 20 years, they'll have a suspended license. It will catch you eventually. You see, what I'm that hammer will all, it'll be over their head from the day they get they get it revoked until they fix it. So that would be the big hammer. It's not one that the court would have, but the law would just be sitting, hovering over them, just waiting for the opportunity to, to land on them. Any further questions for these witnesses? Seeing up. Mr. Blackwood, let me just make sure I've got I've, I'm still in the in the process of getting clarity on on have tos versus want tos. You know, I, what I, happens I, if we don't do this? Well, I'm I'm trying to get my I, we're just trying to get a hold on what is the must do in this bill, and what is the some folks might want to do that probably warrants a little more debate along the lines of what Mr. Ramsey was saying. We don't want you to lose the. We don't want to lose the twenty-five million. I guess that's where we should start, right? Yes, sir. And, and, and let me explain that what happens in that. Uh, that money's and, and that's a variable amount. That's based on what what we we're getting back from Washington for that, that severe fee. Mm -hmm. 
and two and a half percent of that is generally around $25 million. It would be placed into a reserve that the commissioner, DOT, and I would have to agree on, and that is part of it would go for, uh, for safety programs like ours, and then part of it would go into the uh, highway safety uh, infrastructure program, which would not be used for new construction or special effects. Uh, so it, 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 is a, it is a difficult situation sure. for us. And um, and that would be that, that we are we are to be in compliance with that by September 30th of this year. The only thing that that, are, that is required is the 12 months interlock or 12 months hard suspension. Okay. The other aspects of the bill that came, came to the recommendations of, of, of the judges and prosecutors. Okay. And and that okay. was sort of uh, from you know from last year's legislation. As an outgrowth from Senate Bill 236? That's correct. Okay. N now, having heard that for the first time, now it's a little clearer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there, for this, Ms. Ballinger? Yeah, I, I just want a clarification. Yeah. So the only thing that's required for the federal grant is the hard suspension. That's the only thing that the legislature possibly requires. It, it, for it, us it, to continue to review that. Yeah, it, it, any punishment has, has to be. 12 months, you know, if, if there's an interlock, 12 months interlock, or 12 months hard suspension. Okay, so line 33 is in there. It would actually be line 33, and 74 through 84, and then in, and some of the language in section 3 and section 4. Four that talks about the one year versus the okay. eight months. Okay. That's really where okay. the mandatory changes. Okay. I just wanted, I'm just trying to delineate between the wishes and the I have to. Ms. Ramsey. That's exactly what I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. I think we're all thinking the same thing. 70, Jennifer, you said 74 through 84, and what else? That is a federal mandate. Yes, but that's the, well, the, the part of that that talks about the one year versus. Okay. Days in the hundred, uh, sorry, the 45 days in the six months comes from the judges. It's the 12 months, I mean, it's the one year with the permit, with the interlock permit that is the mandatory part. Okay. So really it's 81 through 84, correct? No, sir. 81 no. through 84 is the part about the administrative suspension. Right, okay. It would be, you said 74 through 84. I'm sorry, I misspoke. It was 74 through 8. The part of that that deals with the one year, the 45 days would be okay. permissive. So, just to be clear again, <laughs> line 33 is the federal requirement. Seventy-four through eighty is the federal requirement. Is that a correct statement? Except for the 45, Except for the 45 days. Except for the 45 days. Uh, 134 and 135 is federal, is NHTSA federal requirement, is that correct? No? Yes. No, Judge, I'm 134, lines 134 and 135. That's correct. That's correct. That's the NHTSA requirement as well, as well correct? Yes, sir. Okay. 175 and 176. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Ms. Ammons, you said? 175 and 176. Let me call on Mr. Hightower. I think he's got an additional question. I apologize. You were saying like going to line 74 through 80. You were saying that was part of the federal mandate, but when I read that, it seems like all that is referencing is the 45-day the requirement. I don't see anything in there on the one year unless I'm reading too fast and overlooking it. Yeah, they did, but I read it too fast. 
But I, I believe 74, that entire section there, 74 through 84, 74 through 80, that should be what, that should not be a federal mandate, the way that I read it, if the mandate's only going towards the year requirement. You're correct. I thought that the one with year language was in there, but I was reading too fast. Okay, so 74 through 80 is not part of the mandate. Okay. Could you repeat that again? All of Section 4, you're dealing with habitual violators. Mm -hmm. We've already served a, a two-year hard revocation before they're eligible for the probationary license with interlock. So a hyper-technical interpretation would be that simply by virtue of the hard two-year revocation for those defendants, that's already compliant with NHTSA and we would not have to do anything there if we're being very, very technical. If we wanted to apply the same interlock requirement to them as we do defendants with less convictions, which I think would be reasonable public policy, we would need to make the changes and require the one-year revocate, the one-year interlock permit, but a very technical interpretation of, of the MAP 21 regulation would be that the hard two-year revocation that they've already served would suffice for federal purposes. Okay. It just becomes hard to justify from a layperson understanding you make a second and five driver have an interlock but for the third and five driver you don't because the feds aren't making it. Okay. That's not very easy to understand. Any further questions from members of the committee for this panel? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very much. Judge Lawrence, did you want to come forward? I saw you on the witness list. The uh, national, uh, first of all, I'm Kent Lawrence, um, state court judge out of Athens, senior judge. Um, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that I previously worked for as a judicial outreach liaison, they have changed uh, the ground, uh, the landscape. Uh, in fact, uh, it used to be a 45-day period that a person had to uh, be responsible for. You couldn't reduce it below that number. Now they've just done away with the requirement that used to be in federal legislation was 45 days was the minimum. They vacated that. So now a program could begin and a person could have an ignition interlock device put on the vehicle on the first day of a 12-month sentence, for example. Uh, we would not do that in Georgia, I would think, and we have crafted the language so we have a 45-day period because we need a, a time period to be able to monitor these people to see that they're clearing up. And because it's not unusual, people early on in uh, a program, um, they're very likely to uh, be using alcohol or other drugs. And so you need a, a monitoring period to see if they're going to be compliant. We think 45 days is a reasonable period of time. So that's how we came up with the 45-day period. At the end of the 45-day period, then a judge can, in his or her uh, discretion, uh, issue a certificate of eligibility to where the ignition interlock device goes on for a 12-month period. And then at the end of that 12-month period, the ignition interlock comes off and the offender uh, could continue to drive on a limited driving permit uh, for the remainder of that four and a half month period, which completes the 18-month cycle. Um, in regard to the uh, locations where offenders can drive to, uh, when we were doing Senate Bill 236, I was told very directly from the uh, lead attorney at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, there were only three areas that the offenders could drive to, to work, to school, and to treatment. Well, now they've vacated all those. Now states on an individual basis can do whatever limitations or restrictions they want with regard to implementation of where these offenders can drive. Is that as per a, a reg or as part of MAP 21? They, well, this is part of MAP 21. They just okay. get away with it. Uh, Judge Hoffman and I, uh, Judge Hoffman being from uh, East Lansing, Michigan, and I had uh, worked hard with people with NHTSA to try to get more 
locations where these offenders can drive to. And, and eventually NHTSA just threw their hands up and said, we agree. And so they did away with that requirement of just the three locations. And so now we have, I think it's seven uh, locations that our offenders are able to drive to now. They need to get to court. They have to come to court sessions to be monitored. They have to go to the probation office to see their probation officers. They have to go to the locations they have to get to. And as long as that ignition and lock device is on the vehicle, we can pretty well monitor them and, and observe them and make sure that it is installed. We have a dismal rate in Georgia and in most states across this country. Only about 20% of ignition interlocks in the state of Georgia are put on each year, uh, even though there are a lot more than that demanded. They just don't have them installed. And, and we're not an exception. I mean, uh, there, most states are having that same type of records. Now, Michigan is having success because they have the ability up there and they monitor all, and they have like a 95% compliance rate. Uh, we're far from that, but that's because they, they have the resources to monitor those uh, offenders that, um, that uh, have the ignition interlock installed on their vehicles for that 12-month period. Um, we have not had that type of success in Georgia today. We hope that by bringing these offenders into the 45-day program so that they can get the ignition interlock installed and we know it's installed and we can continue to observe it and we have our own surveillance officers that make sure that that the, you know they're using that device in that vehicle um, is hopefully going to at least increase I hope the uh, our participation in having the ignition and light devices placed on vehicles and in terms of sentencing you're, you're exactly correct there in, in our in the state court I mean I never sent us anyone to less than a 24 month sentence because we need to stack those offenses some people if they've got a longer record we've had 30 month sentences we had 36 months I think the longest uh, misdemeanor sentence I've placed on an offender was someone that had 17 convictions and I put under a four-year sentence. Uh, he turned out to be a graduate from our program and uh, is still sober today. But that's an unusual situation when you have that occur. But uh, it's easy to stack those offenses, the judges, and we do that all the time. I think we only have one or two programs in the, that are operating DUI accountability court programs in the state that only have 12-month periods of uh, programs because the sobriety doesn't really take hold until uh, really about 12 months that we find from the addicted offenders we're dealing with. So it takes longer than 12 months for them to begin to bind to the concept of sobriety. Questions for Judge, uh, Judge Lawrence. Let's try it, John. Would you concur that on for sentencing that it would be clear if we changed the six months to 180 days? I, I don't think it makes any difference. It's the same thing. I mean, Days-wise, 180 days is the same as six months. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think we either, any of us have a problem with that. <laughs> okay. Any further questions for Judge Lawrence? Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Spayhaus, I see you signed up. Briefly, Mr. Chairman, we're here in support of the things that need to be done to protect our federal dollars. The, uh, the NTOC. Uh, the, or not the NTOC, the uh, interlock device ticket and the other thing that has been talked about to support that, that's the only dog the prosecutors have in the fight here, but we do. In the federal mandates. Yes, sir, in the federal mandates. So that's what we're here about. We don't have anything else on that bill. we got a dog in the fight on. Okay. Any questions, Mr. Stahouse? No, seeing none. I think what we'll do is um, we're not going to go ahead and, and take any action on this bill today. I think the wise course of action would be to separate out, and I, this goes to the theme that I heard from several members earlier, separate the, uh, the must-dos versus what some folks want to do. Um, and given the fact that we're generally, if not completely, hearing about the want-to-dos, or both of them, the must-dos and the want-to-dos, uh, the first time today I think we'd do well just to step back and study the bill um, and take a look at the policy consequences of some of the proposals that are in there and uh, weigh the cost benefit of it. Um, is that clear to members of the committee? Any questions or concerns about that approach? My sense is that we'll take action on this bill in some form on Monday, uh, which will probably be our last committee meeting full committee before day 30 unless non-events in Washington dictate a recess in which case we may have an extended recess which is possible but 
um, we're hopeful that's not the case. And I, my sense is that a continuing resolution will probably be passed and the kick, the can will be kicked down the road. But just in case, um, thank you for your attendance here today, and we're adjourned.